Welcome to part 3 of the Unreal Tournament Return to Kutalin Perfect Walkthrough. Right now we're on the map crash site by uh, Matthias Wartz, titled Approaching the UMS Prometheus. First off, I'd just like to point out the music of this current map, just because I find it peculiar. To me, the music doesn't really fit, to be honest. It seems to excite something that isn't there. I guess I mean to say that the mood of the song doesn't go with the atmosphere of the map, because it's not really anything out of the ordinary. We are, aren't discovering anything new. That's what I mean. Well, at least, not yet. I'd say that this sort of location would be fine were it not... were it paired, rather, with, uh, for example, Hub 2 from Harem the Village. Anyway, before the review, because we aren't at a hot spot of the levels, as it were, I'd just like to point out a few things, give you a few tips on these two new weapons. The grenade launcher and the rocket launcher, the, uh, combat assault rifle will be, uh, coming up a little bit. The rocket launcher, that is the new title rocket launcher, not the 8-ball, is what I'm referring to. Now, the grenade launcher has been somewhat controversial in terms of likability, because while it doesn't do a, a lot of damage, relatively speaking, and it isn't in, in other terms pleasing to some players, it is very useful for attacking enemies not in direct line of sight, shooting around corners and so forth. The alternate fire for this weapon allows you to fire a remote controlled projectile, after which pressing uh, the right click again will trigger its explosion. This allows for some creative fighting tactics and kills. If you have good calculation and accuracy, you can ricochet the projectile and explode it at the perfect time to do some uh, acceptable damage to the target. As you can see in a minute or so, this comes very useful with pawns that have direct hit attacks such as the Merc's bullet spray fire. I can't tell whether the missiles fired, um, that is the grenade launcher's projectiles, uh, ha have a function like that of the biofear trigger uh, used with the GES bio rifle, where the green sludge fired produces or spawns a special uh, trigger actor called the biofear, which makes pawns fear, or rather, a uh, avoid that projectile and walk around it and so forth. My point is that in some cases you are able to or might be able to lead a pawn into a projectile, given that the pawn is chasing you from a reachable point to your location, which also means uh, that you must be uh, reachable via navigation. Now, I shan't say more as in, as in the video, I will give you more examples of nice shots and useful tricks with this one. As for the rocket launcher, well, it's a bit of a different story. I will with certainty admit that the rocket launcher is not it, not at all an entirely ineffective weapon, but it has less of a quality rating, if you will, than the grenade launcher from what I've read. I too don't like it too much. It's not very unique, as the 8-ball gun serves very much like the weapon, uh, this weapon, the rocket launcher, and it is often more effective than the new rocket launcher. The differences are that there are a, there is a new alternative fire, and the greater speed and damage compensate for 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 the difference between this and the eight ball gun. Not counting that the eight ball gun can fire multiple shots. The alternative fire seems rather ineffective and well inefficient uh, as well in killing a target. Though I haven't looked at the script for it. It seems to trace a certain object immediately and is slower than the primary fire. Uh, the problem with that is it often uh, targets uh, actors in front of the enemy, such as uh, inanimate actors, and that's a problem. You always want, or rather you should always want that uh, your, your, your projectiles hit the actual target, not a box or something like that. What you can do with this weapon, and I recommend you do, is use it as a backup if you run out of ammo, because while it isn't entirely great, it does damage. You can also use it as a finisher or damage starter to take off some extra health before spending more precious weapons and ammunition. Now, onto the map set review. 
Once more, we're using the more elaborated rubric. Anyway, the atmosphere of this map is somewhat related to that of the ISV Cran, and it very much brings into mind the Starship Dance Pack's commonplace sense of architecture. Though the UMS Prometheus and the ISV Cran were made by the authors, it seems that perhaps part of it due to the Starship Dance Pack, which provides a sort of added tone to the atmosphere. Both maps, both map sets are quite similar to the Total focus on atmosphere, however, the differences of the ISV Cran present a sort of uh, eeriness, whereas the UMS Prometheus sets a clear tone of excitement. This is very much substantiated by the introductory music of both levels, respectively. One of calmness with a hint of caution, if you will, and the other a heavy sense of action. However, with maps such as these, it seems that the the environment itself affects the atmosphere more than the music and less uh, and the less effectual, more subtle components of atmosphere. The problem with the environment of the UMS Prometheus is that it does not really add anything onto the atmosphere. I tried for a good amount of time to really add anything onto the atmosphere. To explicate the environment's relation to the atmosphere, and ultimately I failed. Let me give you an example. Uh, Arendt's map derelict surface uses both in uh, Operation Apollo and Zidia Gold had it an environment that nearly entirely uh, defined its atmosphere. How did it do it? If you really want to know, I recommend you play the UMS Prometheus map set and derelict surface back to back. And you play them slowly and carefully looking at how the environment itself and just the environment affects how you feel during the game time. To summarize, derelict surface starts out with an unusually and seemingly abandoned area, uh, and it is a quiet multi-level industrial zone. The somewhat flooded, worn down, broken, uh, suspiciously uh, empty area creates an environment that can be defined easily, eerily silent, mysterious in a sense, rather uh, suspicious and dangerous. The way you notice how an environment affects the atmosphere itself is by asking yourself these questions. And mind you, this is just one way of analyzing. So the first question would be, do I feel different because of my surroundings, because of the sounds and scenes? And next, can I describe my surroundings in one or two words? Now let me show you why the UMS Prometheus environment doesn't do a good job of standing out. First off, the music is so profound here that you sort of uh, are forced to ignore the environment almost, I dare say, subconsciously. So to answer the first question, no, I do not feel different because of my surroundings, and it, it doesn't have a feel to it. Secondly, I can't really describe my surroundings in two words except for maybe simplistic and monotonous. But those words apply more to visual impact. Now we come to an even bigger problem. I will admit that creating a conceptually grand starship from the inside is a bit difficult with consideration to sizing of the ship and whatnot. But again, it's certainly not impossible. And nowhere near it, really. The ship does have a sense of conceptual grandness from the outside, but that's very short-lived. And the internal and external collectively have little cooperative participation in providing them with conceptual grandness. Matthias Warch seems much more capable of improving visual detail and making small, complex interiors than grand interiors. Even from the outside, there isn't much to gawk in visual um, place in a very small world. There's nothing wrong about the inside of the ship, really, either. Um, it, 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 it was rather plain and simply that everything is excessively trite and repetitive. Which brings me to transition to innovation, on which I need not but say that triteness and repetitiveness are, are the arch enemies, if you will, of innovation. Enough said. But now we're at a, a turning point uh, on the review visual impact. Matthias Warch seems to have the ability to put a great amount of detail into his maps as long as they are composed of small interiors. 
the crash site maps have an above average mean brush count. The map crash site 2 has a brush count of about, uh, about 2100 brushes, which is a lot for a map released in 1999. Though the appearance of the map may be simple, it is still well detailed. The architecture also takes on a simplistic look, and this brings another problem. In Unreal Mapping, architecture is expected to be more complex and original in order for it to sort of uh, be considered well de developed, the UMS Prometheus takes on a more Quake Engine look. More simplicity and more visual dependence on textures. So, sort of a Quake Engine may, uh, look may work well with, with the Quake Engine, but Unreal has the potential for a lot more in terms of architecture. One example of this is the Prometheus uh, the hallways in the Prometheus. I'm sure they could have uh, been created more interesting, but they were left to be largely rectangular. Uh, let's look at the interiors of this map, and I need not say more. The architecture is, candidly speaking, sim and simply simple. If, but it seems that, uh, again, we're getting to the climax of the review. This is the best part for the UMS Prometheus, and the best aspect of Wartz's mapping in the gameplay, namely the combat intensity has, has a, a lot more potential being achieved. There's a mercenary waiting uh, for you at every corridor. Mercenaries are certainly viable and sometimes even challenging opponents, especially when you are low on ammunition. So while their projectiles may be slow, their spray fire ability and shield allow for more challenging gameplay. The only problem is that's only opponent you face through the entire map in terms of gameplay flux, uh, which is basically how easily the player flows throughout the map from beginning to end. And, uh, and uh, let me just, just uh, add on to this: gameplay flux can can be seen, for example, in a map such as uh, Half Life. Half Life. Let's, let's just give a simple example of the first uh, map in Half-Life, the Anomalous Materials. It's very, very simple and very, very flowing map. The player does not have to stop and wait and, and figure out where he's supposed to go. It's, it's very obvious where you're supposed to go. Granted, it may not necessarily be the best example because Simplicity is not necessarily a good thing always. You always want to have sort of a creativity when when uh, guiding the player throughout the map. But more, um, uh, an opposite example would, for example, be the uh, Cheezer maps, wherein there there is a sense of a flow in the map, but often, especially if you're a, a new, new player in a real you to the Unreal series in general. It's difficult for you to uh, go throughout the map without having to go back and forth, finding where you're supposed to go, what button you're supposed to push. But anyway, uh, in terms of gameplay flux, the ship can be somewhat confusing, but it is for the most part uncomplicated for the player understand where to go once he explores the map. Storyline in this is also well developed. There are a large amount of uh, translator events depicting the history and recent happenings of the This deserves a lot of credit, mostly due to the fact that the real and the real returns in the poly maps do not really attempt to detail well the background or any sort of storyline regarding the happenings in game. In contrast to all that, Forge's UMS Prometheus does outstanding implementing storyline. The setting, of course, along with a large amount of voice logs, imply it and add on even more to the well elaborated storyline. I think that this is the standard all in real maps should aim for, not only for the sake of critical view, but in order to provide more depth and meaning to the map so that the players can appreciate the map more and grab uh, and have the map grab the player's attention more. And it also works well in the end when the storyline implementation is acknowledged as an important factor in the map.
Prometheus came down hard in the valley, shedding debris as she dropped out of the sky. There are bodies everywhere. I have to assume that the whole crew was wiped out. 150 souls. God, I hate this planet. The ship is a nightmare. The hull is breached in several places, one of the engine cores is melted down, and the corridors are infested with mercenaries. But I'm close to being done. I just need to find the data cores and then trigger the ELT on the bridge. Now we arrive at another part of the UMS Prometheus. This area seems not so much to act as a region of the map built for gameplay or anything of the sort. Granted, there are a few monsters here and there. If you notice, though, the odd silence and the suspicious ambient sounds, uh, I feel as if this area acts more as the exposition or the build-up for the upcoming one and only marine fight, which I will also comment on how to win without being damaged. By some miracle, the translite communication system on the Prometheus is still working. While I was exploring the comm center, I came across this exchange captured and recorded by the computers. New space warship UMS Bodega Bay. Prepared to take whatever steps are necessary to ensure the success of Operation Talon Hunter. Acknowledged. Uh, Bodega Bay, one more thing. Operation Talon Hunter is classified Deep Ultra. Once you've finished your mission, you must implement measures to eliminate any security risks. Starlight base. Bodega Bay, make sure prisoner 849 doesn't come back. Terminate the prisoner once the job is done. Understood, Starlight Base. We will dispose of prisoner 849 after Operation Talon Hunter is concluded. Bodega Bay, out. I've been betrayed. Why does this not surprise me? I should have known what to expect from those bastards. I guess all I can do is play out this hand. Recover the data cores, activate the ELT on the bridge, and then try to hijack the shuttle when they come get me. It's a long shot, but it's all I've got. If I don't make it, and someone ever recovers this log, maybe the truth will get out. Now I find it here useful just to point out some uh, things when handling uh, ponds such as marine. Although I did a uh, comment on that, I think, in one of the other videos, I'd just like to point out that one of the best ways to eliminate Marines without being damaged is this part of you know, the point of uh, all these videos is to, again, kite them. Uh, like I was saying, like I will say with the, the UMS Marines, where one of the methods will be to, to kite them, which is a term for just basically dragging them around where you want them to go. Basically, uh, you know, enticing them to, to take a bait and then killing them when, when it's necessary to do so. So, for example, as you can see here, I've actually done this with, I think, all of the Marines. I've uh, provoked them, then dragged them around to the back or something in a, an area where it's, it's viable to shoot around corners or do something without being damaged. Now, this is not what I do the entire time throughout the, the Unreal uh, 
return to Nepali, uh, you know, walk through. However, this is a very useful method, especially if you're you're sort of new to trying to to do damage control. But you'll see, especially in in uh, some of the other uh, parts of the walkthrough, especially in, for example, Foundry, that I do a lot of more intermediate dodging and whatnot. But that's just one method. Now there are two methods to defeating the Space Marines that are effective, although one, to be frankly, is rather impractical and depends on kiting in close quarters combat, wherein you use unreal tournament tricks such as shooting around corners to do damage control. Granted, it is difficult to gauge the speed or tactic that drives the Marines to go wherever, so you might have a problem knowing where to fire. On the other hand, there is another nice method I've discovered that you will uh, see here in a minute. I find it rather uh, hilarious. The code which the Space Marines is based off of is from the player pawn as in uh, bo actual bots. But that's not at all the problem until you have some uh, kind of odd pathing system as you'll see here. Which is lovely here because it allows you to take great advantage of it. And uh, let me just have a drum roll here as a pretense to the comicality of what's actually going to happen. Yes, that's it. Simple navigation point exploitation killed two squads of UMS Marines. I actually didn't do anything t so technical that I might have looked in, for example, Unreal Editor or anything. I went around this map a bit uh, before actually recording, and I explored and uh, sort of experimented the possibilities of the methods to kill these guys without being damaged, because frankly, they are probably the hardest pawn you'll ever face. What you basically do uh, to make sure that you aren't damaged uh, and to do this effectively is uh, basically you, you go around provoking them, make sure they have them, they have you in your sights, and you just wait for them up in this elevator. Sometimes you might have uh, to jump down the elevator and go back to get them to do stuff like that. And uh, there you go. And uh, there you go. Oh, and here's the grand finale from the special movie. Thanks for watching.
I whacked the Marines, but I couldn't find their shuttle. It must have returned to the Bodega Bay. When I realized that the shuttle was gone, I almost gave up. It all seemed so hopeless. But things were even worse the last time I was down here, and somehow I made it. Eventually, I decided to keep going. And it's a good thing I did, because there is hope after all. One of the Marines had a radio with a live frequency. There's another squad about ten clicks west of here holed up in some kind of fortress. I don't know how I'm going to get over there, but they've got a shuttle, and by God, I'm going to get it.